Okay, it's a couple of minutes past, so let's make a start. Welcome to the uh, November monthly meeting. Um, just a, a heads up and reminder that we're recording the session. We'll post the recording um, afterwards. Uh, there'll be a, a link to it on the, um, the web page that's associated with the, the meeting, the one that was posted in the Slack. Uh, just quick sanity check, uh, people can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Steve. Sounds good, audio is working. All right, so we'll follow the same uh, format that we've been using for a, a little while now. This is meant, yeah, intended to be a, a pretty interactive session, so please participate. Um, we, we, don't, we don't have a, a too big a crowd at the moment. We've got about 20 people, so... Um, when you've got uh, something to say, just unmute and say it. And you know, if it gets too noisy, we'll we'll go to like a hands up or something. But uh, we'll keep it keep it fairly informal and and free flowing for the moment. Um, if you're not already, uh, please join the Nurse User Slack. It's a really good um, forum for you know discussing with other users and uh, and nurse staff who are sort of you know, on the on a bit of an occasional basis. Um, you know, uh, things going on on NERSC systems and uh, NERSC events and yeah, good place to sort of ask, ask questions and offer help. So uh, our agenda today will follow the normal pattern of uh, start out talking about wins of the month um, and today I learned which is sort of, yeah, two, two sides of the you know, what interesting uh, news do people here have. Um, and also we have a, a whole bunch of announcements and uh, calls for participation at the moment. Uh, then we'll go into our topic of the day, which today is going to be uh, preparing for uh, allocation year 2022. And Helen's online and uh, she'll walk us through a lot of the you know, stuff that's useful to know and what to expect as the uh, transition comes up. Uh, finish up with just a, a bit of a heads up of what's coming up and a quick look at uh, what's been going on on the system in the last month. So our first section is win of the month. The aim here is for uh, this is an opportunity to, to show off an achievement or to shout out somebody else's achievement that you know of. Uh, and it can be, you know, any, any kind of level really from uh, solving a a bug that had been, you know, keeping you, uh, you know, giving giving you grief for a little bit to having a paper accepted somewhere, um, something significant that you achieved, you know, in your in your normal work that might be a candidate for a uh, award at NERSC, a uh, high impact scientific achievement or innovative use of high performance computing award. Has anybody got anything they'd like to uh, celebrate to kick us off with or show off? Hey, Stephen, it's David Trevich. Yeah, yeah. David. Uh, I just, I've already shared it with Brandon and Jack, but uh, I'm see, I have uh, up to max nodes on Perlmutter. I'm achieving oh, the best nice. scaling. Uh, up to, uh, sorry, achieving the best scaling I've achieved ever on any machine. So including uh, uh, asymptotic behavior at the higher node counts. So this is really good news. That sounds really good. So you're able to run a more or less full system job. Uh, uh, it's up to 960. I could go more, but it's a factor of two. It's a factor of two. So I don't, there's 1920 nodes yeah. aren't available, but I do have a question. What's, yeah. what's going to be available in phase two? Phase two, you know, I've forgotten the number of nodes off the top of my head, I think. Ooh. I might have to look that up. We we do have it written somewhere on on one of the web pages. Uh, a nurse person here might might be able to remind me what it is. The the number I have in my head is I think it's some something in the order of is it six thousand um, CPUs, six thousand nodes. I need to look that up and and get back to you. But of course there'll be CPU nodes. Uh, they'll each each node will have 
uh, two sockets of their AMD Milan CPUs, uh, and they won't have GPUs. So that be that's sixty four threads, correct? Uh, I believe or, the Milan has or is it 32? cores and 128 threads. Okay, here, Nick just... Uh, got so it, in, okay. Yeah, in, in terms of open MP threads, chances are you'll want to run yeah, yeah. 64 and not 128 because most, you know, most right. HPC things you know, can, can make good use of the full core, where, yes, uh, uh, some workflows... Yeah, you know, can make good use of hyperthreads because each each task isn't fully using the core. It's you know got um, you know lots of uh, okay. yeah <laughs> opportunities. For okay, thank you. But, uh, but that sounds you, great. Um, so nine nine hundred and sixty nodes and and strong scaling all the way up. Uh, weak scaling. We don't oh, we don't scale. Strong scale. Yep. Yeah, the application code doesn't strong scaling is not practical. Uh, yeah. yeah, actually, strong scaling to nine hundred and sixty. No, it's, it's, it's quite challenging. It's, uh, yeah, you need a massive problem. <laughs> right, right. Does right. that application use GPU as well? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's GPU, com completely GPU enabled and uh, threaded. So, so how uh, many GPUs do you use per node? Uh, four. For GPUs, What's so, by four so is... do you do the oversubscribing from the core CPU core to the GPU? Oversubscribing. Tell me what that means. Means you use, let's see, uh, uh, depends on your application, uh, how it is done. Sometimes it's a one-to-one, -one, means you only use one core and had dedicated GPU cores. GPU yeah, device. One, one core, one core, one GPU per MPI rank and one MPI rank per core, if okay. that helps. Yeah. Got it? Now, do you use yeah. more than one? Let's say you have four GPU devices on the node. Do you use yes. more than one, uh, more than four cores per node on the CPU? Uh, uh, I'm using dash C32, if that, in open MP threads of, uh, 64. So okay. So so each MPI task is actually using quite a few open MP threads as well as as well as yeah. one GPU. It's a it's a pretty big problem too. So for even though even though it's 960 nodes, it's but it's not the like this problem would scale up on uh Cori to about well all nodes on Cori. So eight, 8192 factor of two. And uh, 524, yeah. 288 cores uh, with no threading. Um, so but, this uh, that what you run on Cori with uh, Haswa only or with a GPU? The KNL. Oh, KNL. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But KNL is different here because the, oh, yeah, the computer is, model is, is different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm just telling you, giving you historical. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But did you make any changes to your application to use the GPU device? Uh, yes. I mean, Petsy has to be Petsy Hyper CUDA. So that's okay. one of the main things. Yeah. And uh, work with Mark Adams and I have been working on that for quite a bit and some people in the Hyper team. So, uh, yep, but it's using the GPUs, using them pretty efficiently. I might add. Okay, that's interesting. For, yeah. for the initial, for these initial scaling tests, that's like the in, first initial scaling test. That's not even, that's without any optimization on Perlmutter itself. Mm -hmm. So that's like the first, first light. That's sounding really promising. We're, we're seeing some pretty good um, yeah, early, early results, I think, with, um, yeah, scaling and uh, performance. This would be the Chombo code, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, CFD, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's Chombo Crunch. It's really just the CFD solver uh, of Chombo Crunch. Nice okay, way. that's all I got. Yeah, that sounds good. And I just noticed in the in the chat that uh, Nick posted phase two will have uh, three hundred and seven two nodes. So yeah, a little over six thousand AMD uh, sockets. Each one having but those one code. does not have a GPU per node, right? No. So the phase two are CPU only nodes. Right. So phase so, phase one is the GPU 
So yeah. this, well, maybe this is a far off question. So for the GPU only, uh, CPU only node, can they access a GPU device on a different node? Not directly. Um, yeah, the, the GPUs are sort of dedicated they're, to they're, the node. Yeah, they're, okay. yeah, they're, they're PCI there. Yeah, they're on the on the board. So to access the GPU on a different node, it, it would pretty much have to you know, be doing a kind of a, a what do you call it? Yeah, heterogeneous um, MPI yeah, computing. kind of code. Yeah. OK. Wait, wait, so are you saying that we will, we will be able to run uh, jobs on both phase one and phase two? Um, yeah, I think job. we're hoping that that's going to be possible, but I don't know for certain if it's been established yet. Okay, because I mean, you, you can't deal with KNL and Haswell, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think with KNL Haswell, it's, it's another one thing that's it's, it's theoretically possible, but it's, yeah, <laughs> practically challenging. <laughs> but, well, I, I, it, you can't do with configuration because you have to say it is Haswell or yeah. it is KNL in the in the dashboard. Yeah, that, that's a hard partition. Here, I don't know, you know, whether mm -hmm. potential there is a potential, but I don't know whether the software system software or the hardware will support that. Yeah, it's just a question. Some, some yeah. logistical challenges to yeah, um, you know, to be able to do that. Okay. Um, and I see in the chat, uh, Nan asked the question, do we know when the CPU nodes will become available? And the answer is uh, and not yet. I don't think a date has been announced for phase two yet. Uh, can I ask a question, a follow-up on that? Yeah. Um, so if we're looking at um, applying for some time on Perlmutter, is there yeah. guidance on how we should um, estimate node hour charging and things like that? Um, are you talking about particularly for CPU nodes or? CPU nodes, yeah. Generally. Uh, I think we do have some information about that actually in last month, no, the month before in October's um, monthly meeting, um, Clayton went through, or did a, a bit of a walkthrough uh, ERCAP and sort of you know, preparing for, for next year. And one of the slides that he had uh, was talking about that, you know, estimating and, and sort of you know, translating nurse hours for the different, um, you know, for, for the various resources available next year. Uh, so that slide deck should be um, you know, available on the, the webinar site from it. And I think it's also somewhere in our docs, although I don't remember exactly where we'll have to uh, look that up. But oh, yeah, great. there is some there is some guidance about that. Uh, if you take take a look in October's meetings, October's is is probably a good um, starting point. Great, yeah, I know for the um, you know for the ERCAP they had charging factor type things, but uh, in the specific award we're looking at, they're asking for uh, node hours. So I just wasn't sure whether I should and not the charging factor. So. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I will mention something about the charging factor. Basically, there's a 400 um, what, and, and original NERSC hours uh, is now called one node hours. Original uh, hours were based on Hopper. Now we're basing charges on parameter. Um, so you'll be going through that? Yeah, you'll see a table I'm showing the Wonderful. version. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Sounding good. Um, so before we move on to the next thing, that was that was quite a good discussion. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to shout out as a win of the month? And if not, we can hop across to the next side of the the, the other side of the coin, which is you know, today I learned. Um, and here we're interested in hearing stories of uh, uh, something that surprised you that might benefit others to learn about. And this can be this can be either you know something that you you stumbled across or or you know learned about your know, ways of uh, using the system um, that improve things. But it can also be you know something that tripped you up. Um, you know this is 
we we do research we're uh, discovering new things and learning things the hard way all the time and you know rather than kind of being you know put off or 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 wanting to to hide the things that didn't work uh, yeah there's a lot of benefit in actually making noise about the things that didn't work and you know ah here's here's what didn't work and here's how i fixed it or i don't know how to fix it yet maybe somebody else does I can I can kick us off with one that is uh, it's a it's a mixture of a, a today I learned and, and you know, it was actually a little bit of a you know a, a, a win I thought as well it was it was quite an enjoyable um, challenge to work on um, with the help of uh, one of our users who had a code that was running a bit um, you know, slower than it needed to and an inconsistent performance. And we had some tools on the system that you know I hadn't actually dug too far into myself. And one of them is uh, Dashan. And with Dashan, was able to see with this code that it was doing a, a surprisingly high number of IO calls. And it wasn't well; it was moving a lot of data, um, but it was moving a lot more data than it needed to. So you know, it was it was it was reading you know, a few hundred megabytes of file, but but moving several gigabytes backwards and forwards, and and doing you know millions of io calls uh, and so yeah with a little bit of uh, digging around we we're able to establish that it was that uh, it was using a list directed io in fortran to read in a text file and, and when fortran does list directed io uh, it reads you know, a certain amount at a time because it's essentially translating from um, you know from ascii text or unicode text probably ascii actually um, you know, and converting it into binary. And the default buffer size is only 132 bytes. So it was reading 132 bytes at a time and, you know, fetching that in many, many small and um, uh, operations. And of course, each operation actually fetches a, a bigger block than what it's reading. So, so there was a whole lot of operations there. And by just setting an environment variable and the Intel compiler kind of has some environment variables for um, your runtime behavior, we're able to greatly reduce the number of reads. And you know, in that, you know, greatly reduce the, um, you know, the overall amount of time spent by uh, IO in this job. And you know, the whole thing ran a whole lot faster. So, so that was a really interesting thing to learn using, using Darshan to sort of discover what it was that was going on. And uh, we have some notes about that one in our web page as well. And there's just kind of a, a little script it's enabled by default. So, you know, most code that you build, unless you've explicitly switched it off, will be collecting this IO data. Uh, it uses the MPI layer. So I think if your code isn't MPI, it, you know, if for, for serial codes, it may not. Well, well, maybe it does, but you need to need to run it under S run. But uh, yeah, in any case, take take a look at it. It's, um, yeah, it turned out to be uh, really, really helpful. Anyone else got uh, something they've uh, tripped up on or discovered? Steve, just a, 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 a simple question for you. When they put yeah. that flag up, what techniques do they use? Are uh, optimization uh, techniques that, that flag? Use to reduce the total number of IO reads? Is that oh. a buffering or reuse or what? Yeah, so in so in this case, it was about buffering. So um, the the file was being read from the community file system, which is a you know, it's like a, a network attached yeah. file system. It's not it's not on the node, uh, and so each time it does a read, it, it fetches kind of a you know, at, at the lower level, it's fetching a bigger block. It's probably fetching like a, a disk block of you know, four or eight k or something like that. Um, but because it was only actually reading one hundred and thirty two bytes at a time. Um, you know what I'm not sure of is why uh, it kept on fetching the larger size, or maybe yeah, the, so why is yeah, that why the, wasn't yeah, able to why use is, that at the operating system level? It may have been sort of dropping buffers, using you know, using up more of its memory. Um, but okay. yeah, they're, they're, I, that is a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my question. I I don't know whether you have that information or not. The, the buffering, is that in the main memory? Use a bigger chunk 
or use uh, like a SSD, this kind of thing, or buffer, burst buffer, this kind of thing. Oh, so this is actually using um, in, inside in memory in the Fortran runtime library. Oh, okay. So when, when it comes down to the POSIX read calls that it's doing, so, so you know, at, at the Fortran level, you're, you're, you're doing Fortran yeah. code, but underneath it's yeah. calling these um, yeah, system POSIX kind of calls. Okay. And each list directed IO was, was essentially calling read with 132 byte buffer to read into. And so okay. by changing, changing this environment variable, we turn it into like a, a 10 megabyte buffer. Uh, okay. so, so then yeah, there were fewer of these POSIX read calls. Uh, I see Ivan's asked in the chat, uh, what was the name of the tool for which we debugged it? So the tool is called Darshan. Um, I'll write it in the chat for spelling. And if you do a, a module list when you log into Cori, uh, you'll see one of the default modules is Darshan. And what having that module loaded will do is when you compile a code, it uh, the compiler wrappers, the Cray compiler wrappers automatically link in the Darshan library if the module is loaded. Um, and then at runtime, if the module is loaded, uh, it will collect the uh, IO data. And it's basically each, each time it does a, a POSIX read call or an MPI IO, sorry, POSIX read or write uh, MPI IO call, um, it collects information about you know, the, the call, the time spent in it, and the amount of data moved. And uh, it puts it in a location on Scratch that you can read. And in the docs, if you do a search for Darshan in our, in our docs, you'll find some notes on it. Um, and there's a, a script there that you can basically generate a PDF of the, you know, kind of the, the report. And it's kind of just a high level summary report of things like you know, the um, IO to, you know, block sizes, how, how many IO calls there were and how big each IO call was and so on like that. So, so uh, yeah, that was a really interesting thing to explore in, and use and uh, yeah, quite enjoyed um, tinkering with it and learning about it. So yeah, I'll, I'll recommend it to everybody else too. So the, in addition to the IO operations, does it also offer some uh, like IO buffering operations inside? Uh, do you mean um, Dashen or the Fortran? Yeah, Dashen, Dashen. Uh, Dashen itself doesn't. Dashen is, is just purely measurement, measurement and reporting. Okay. So, but then you can you know, use those things. I guess it's kind of the IO version of a, of a profiling tool. A profile. like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to either talk about or ask about? And if not, we'll move on to our Next uh, uh, block of uh, things, which is announcements and calls for participation. And this month we have quite a few. Um, there are uh, several that uh, in your weekly email, so you can go back and, and look that up. Um, some reminders of uh, important ones. Uh, ALCC pre-proposals are due this week, this Friday, which is to say tomorrow. Uh, you may have uh, noticed, particularly if you're logging in from LBL, uh, we now have a, a federated ID pilot. And what federated ID uh, does is allow you to use your own institution login to log in to NERSC. You can link them together. So, so the pilot is just for LBL users. So if you're, if you're part of um, Berkeley Lab, you uh, should be able to, or yeah, when, you, when you log into certain NERSC things like um, you know, help.nursc, yeah, help.nursc.gov, uh, IRIS, and so on, um, have the opportunity to kind of link your, if your LBL, LBL account to your NERSC account, and then you'll be able to log into those NERSC services with your LBL login. So you can kind of basically save you one more um, login session. Um, heads up that the winter holiday is coming up and NERSC services will be particularly consulting service and so on, will be shut down during it. So, so there'll be no consulting between December 24 and January 3, and there'll be much more limited account support than usual. The systems will still be up, um, just that you know, getting, getting help might take a little longer. Uh, and of course, the big one that Helen's going to talk, tell us about in, in much more detail in a, in a few moments is that the uh, allocation year transition 
is happening on January 19th. I see there's a question from G in the chat. When would the award decision of 2022 allocation be announced? Oh, I think that's this week as well. Uh, check, check the weekly email in your inbox. I, uh, I think there's a note about it. But I think that that one is planned for this week or if not, then next week. So it's, it's coming up very soon. Uh, Helen might know in more detail. Um, a few announcements about uh, Perlmutter. So we have a, a user training for Perlmutter on January 5 to 7. There's a link to a web page here. We'll post these slides on the, um, on the meeting web page so that you can just sort of click on that link, which you'll also be able to find them fairly easily. Uh, another training coming up just after that, January 12 and 13, is one on the NVIDIA HPC SDK, which is to say the, the NVIDIA compiler suite. Uh, that's our default compiler on Perlmutter and the one that we recommend for um, you know, using the GPUs. So uh, this is going to be a, a very useful training to, to join. Um, other Perlmutter news. If, you're, if you have a GPU ready workload, um, you can get early access to Perlmutter. So it's still not open in a general sense. It's still in its sort of early access phase, uh, but we have a uh, access request form that you can get to by clicking on this link. We'll put, put the, the slides up shortly. Um, for a GPU ready codes. Uh, also, there's a few kind of uh, things to remember when you're using both Perlmutter and Cori is that home is shared on both systems, um, but each system has its own sort of software stack. So you, you might want to adjust your dot files, especially if you do things like module loads in there. Um, yet more announcements. The annual NERSC annual user survey is currently open. Um, I know we've had quite a good number of responses, but not as many as we would like. So please, if you haven't uh, participated in the survey yet, uh, please do so. Uh, you should find a personalized link in your email within a couple of weeks ago now. It will have come from uh, an address, uh, nurse at mbriresearch.com. Um, and yeah, following that link should uh, take you through to the survey. Uh, I guess if you can't find it in your email, there's a chance it might be in spam. It's worth checking that. But um, the annual survey is kind of really valuable for nurse on, on sort of two fronts. One is that it uh, helps us to identify uh, areas that, you know, what we're doing well and, and what we want to focus on for improving for the next year. Uh, and also it's um, very valuable in our reporting back to DOE, uh, which, you know, affects our funding which uh, affects uh, you know, resources available to everybody. So it's a, a really uh, important one to uh, participate in. Um, if you have a, or if you are or know a postdoc, um, or sorry, a, a postgrad who is uh, yeah, looking for, or interested in a, a fellowship and a, and a good candidate for a fellowship, um, Applications for the DOE Computational Science Graduate Fellowship are now open. This is for, for first and second year PhD students. It's a, it's a great program. Uh, the James Corona's Award in Leadership Community Building and Communication uh, nominations are open at the moment. And this one's aimed at uh, mid-career scientists and engineers, which is uh, kind of an important uh, area. That's all that I have noted. Does anybody else have announcements that they'd like to make or call attention to. And if not, wrong button. Uh, if not, I will hand the screen across to Helen, who will walk us through what to prepare or what to expect in preparing for the transition to allocation year 2022. Hey, Steve. Um, can I share my screen? Hi, everyone. Um, today I'm going to just walk through the AY 2021 to the 2022 transition. So here's a brief outline. I will talk about the allocations for the new year, 
and the transition process and what happens on the start day of this new allocation year. What are the new changes um, that we are ex um, expect users can expect? And what about discontinued users? Um, allocation year 2022 uh, uh, range from uh, starts from January 19th. It's uh, normally we do this on the third Wednesday of January and until the so Tuesday of January in the next year. The make sure uh, you understand that uh, the last year's allocation hours do not carry over. The award emails will go out this week. And this year we have separate CPU and GPU awards. The CPU awards can be used for Cori and Perlmutter CPU and the GPU allocation uh, can be used for the Perlmutter GPU. Um, for each project, we do give out a minimum amount of 100 node hours. Um, node hours is our new unit. Uh, I will talk about this in a later slide. There's a, we use the same unit, node hours on CPU and node hours on GPU. They're both based on the Perlmutter system. The charges um, on query starts on January 20, 20th, the second day of the new allocation year. And uh, Perlmutter will still remain free of charge until further notice, maybe sometime around mid-year mid after the phase one and phase two integration completed. So what happens at the AY transition usually? So first we need to update the IRS database with the new allocation data, new projects, use, new users, all these allocation um, hours and storage awarded. Then the computational systems need to sync up with this active database. And we need to clean up old batch jobs that are, do not have the allocation continuing. And then we sometimes do system maintenance on the day as well. And we will have some new policies, new software at the AI transition. So there's a whole web page, and you can read more about it. And also I will uh, talk briefly today as well. This is the time now, it's shortly before it AY 2022 starts. So some of the things already we start processing, for example, uh, the new AY, uh, the, the AY 2021 project requests, uh, we are not, uh, not accepting those um, as of October 14th. And the week before the AY starts, we will not process any new user account. Um, now DOE also needs to validate them. So no user, new user account creation or validation for that week. And after, shortly after you receive the, um, your awarded um, projects allocation, then uh, the PIs need to do something. Um, you have a, a month or so to do that. And last deadline is the last day of the AY21. The PIs or, or proxies, they, you have to um, nominate which users in your project will continue and you also have to decide which user will have premium QoS access. There's an, I, an API in Iris uh, in your project, and then you go to the roles tab, you'll see two additional columns. Um, it'll only uh, um, exist for this month or so duration in Iris. And then the PIs can go in and check box for of, of your users who want to continue and enable premium. And there's also a recommended um, recommendation for PIs users to check your premium jobs currently in the queue, and maybe you want to update them to regular, since um, there's a chance that those jobs, if won't, they didn't run now, and they start to run next year, they might be, you now you have to pay 2X of the charge. And if the users, um, if the, uh, your PI forget to your checkbox the premium, then that job will be deleted if it's not changed to, to regular as well. On the um, start day of the AY 2022, it's uh, January 19th. In the morning, seven o'clock, um, the IRS database will be um, doing the new transition of, um, of, of updating to all the new uh, allocation year data. So if you already logged into that, into IRS during that time, you need to log out and back log back in to see the new data. We'll have a uh, scheduled maintenance for Corey on that day. And for Perlmutter, uh, we have decided not to do a downtime this week. There is actually one uh, maintenance bef 
and there's uh, two maintenance, one week before and one week after for more uh, substantial system upgrades. But during uh, this transition day on this day, um, and the only thing we need to do is the Slurm, uh, the Slurm database sync with Iris. And while doing this live, you may experience very short period of slowness. Other than that, our system appear, will appear to be um, up. And all the other system services will be up on that day as well. Also on this um, AY start day, we will process some and delete some old jobs that are no longer um, in, no longer valid for the new year. So for example, jobs associated with non-continuing projects, jobs um, with, the, with the continuing project, but the user is no longer a member for the um, project. This can happen if a, uh, your PI forget to renew this um, user. Or um, they have premium jobs, if you no longer have access to the premium QoS, or the overrun jobs, this usually happens uh, for users um, who over already exhaust the allocation year. So for the new year, start, starting the new year, all the overrun jobs doesn't make sense. And all the user health jobs are older than 12 weeks um, per our policy will also be deleted. Um, so here is the um, information about new allocation units and new charging factors. As I mentioned, uh, each project has a separate CPU and GPU allocations, We're all based on parameter node hours. So charging factor for parameter CPU is 1.0, charging factor for parameter GPU is also one. And if you want to convert um, new and old hours, we used to do CPU, uh, we use on CPU only. For Corey, for example, here have the NERC, we have the unit of NERSC hours, which is based on Hopper CPU hours. Now um, to do the, based on the um, capacity and performance, uh, we decided this, uh, the equivalent factor is one new parameter CPU node hour is the equivalent of 400 node hours on um, Hopper. So here is a table that you can see for, um, for, <clears throat> for charging unit, you can see the, um, the unit here and a house wall in, AY 2021, the charging factor was uh, is 140 divided by 400. Uh, the new um, charging factor will be 0 0.34. And KNL, um, a, the original 80, uh, the charging factor of 80 divided by uh, 400 is 0 0.2. So you might see a small number of allocations and don't, don't um, be panic, <laughs> don't panic. It's uh, times 400 is about equivalence of you are getting for the next year. For the GPU, um, I, I don't list it on the table. There's only one system parameter, it's one, and the future system will be based on the parameter fact, factor. Uh, so for the changes um, for AY 2022, we have a new default Python module. It'll be changed to 3.8 Anaconda 2021.5. It's Python 3, uh, normal Python 2 support. So if users doing pip packages install, uh, you'll find your installation bit uh, in the uh, new version directory. There are, um, the updates in this installation include Memba, um, this is, which is a faster alternative to Conda. There's a newer NetCD4, MPI4, PY, and this is also an Auslib, which is um, used for support uh, for the NERSC Super Facility API. And you can find all this information in our Python documentation. If you, um, the version is already existing on Corey's non-default and it is the default um, parameter. So you can use it. And if you find anything, uh, any issues, you can already report to us uh, via our help portal or filing, a, which means file a nurse consulting ticket. We will also, we also plan to do a big uh, Corey OS upgrade to accommodate the um, the the <clears throat> system uh, system um, need for, for supporting matching the, the you know for example the security um, requirement um, from from our HPE or from DOE management so and we promise this is going to be our last major planned major OS upgrade unless there's another critical security concerns um, we have to do that 
so while doing the OS upgrade, we are also going to update the PE default. PE comes in in a, in a Cray development toolkit version. It, it's released um, previously monthly, but for, for Cray, it's now slowed down. It's uh, three times a year uh, release. So it, com it includes all these the Cray supported packages such as MPI, LibSci, NetCDF, HDF5, compilers, uh, performance tools, a lot of things in it. And um, it, so if we upgrade a CDT version, meaning we're going to get all these packages having a new software default. Then we're also going to upgrade, uh, not upgrade to, to our change our Intel compiler default version to a, a newer version. Then uh, we'll provide an, a web page later with all the details of this version change. And uh, it'll be announced in our weekly uh, email. So one thing you have to do if your application is statistically compiled, you have to relink because of the OS upgrade. And we do recommend you to rebuild all applications because of the newer software default and also the OS upgrade. NERSC plans to rebuild all our supported software um, before Cori is upgraded. So last slide about discontinued users. If users um, with no active project for New Year, they consider it's discontinued as effective on the first day, but they will have a month to access the systems. They cannot run batch jobs, but they can log in, access their files and uh, bring them back to their system. For longer storage HPSS, they still have write access for one month and then um, five more months to read only, and then they'll uh, have no access to HPSS. So this is all I have. Um, thank you very much. And if there are any questions I can answer, I will also check uh, the chat messages. Hey, Hanan, you mentioned that Corey's uh, update schedule will be three times a year. Do you have any uh, calendar date target? Oh, What's no, no, no. Uh, I that doesn't mean Corey will be updating every three times a year. I was talking about this Cray um, PE called CDT, Cray Performance Tool, uh, Cray yeah, Developer yeah. Toolkit release is three times a year. We don't have to install them. We don't have to change our default. This okay. is just their release. Um, in the past, um, they do release this every month. And we were doing about um, quarterly uh, installation ish newer versions, but also we were having in um, like a year or so to do to change our default. But you mean a, a delay about a year? Not delay. Also. I mean, I was talking about how often do we change our um, default Default here. Yeah. Okay. Um, we promise not to change less than a year unless there's OS upgrade. We just require to change it because the older yeah, versions yeah. won't be compatible. So the last version we had is like we had it in uh, 2020, it's late. <laughs> so it will be almost two years before we change uh, default this time. And we plan not to change it anymore before Corey retires. Okay. W what is the projected retire date for Corey? Uh, we don't know yet, but it should uh, at least last through this year. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Lots of um, lots of good information there, and quite a lot to take in. Um, is there anywhere particularly that users should look for? I guess uh, finding this information when the allocation year transition comes up. I mean, we'll post these slides on this meeting website. And the question about allocation limits for the ALCCL, I actually don't know about the limits. Um, if you could submit a ticket to, and we could forward it to the allocations team to answer your question then. Thanks, Helen, I'll do that. Actually, just for clarification, it's not the limit, it's that they're asking um, the wording of the call talks about the Perlmutter um, hours that are available, but it says not to use a charging factor. So I'm just a little confused about the wording. 
So okay, yeah, just go ahead and ask your question in the ticket. So I didn't mention it explicitly in the talk today. The ALCC ALCC actually goes at uh, six months off cycle of our ER cap. So the ALCC um, allocations runs from June, July to June, and <laughs> the um, the uh, allocation request also it goes through a different cycle, obviously. Thank you. Sure. Thanks again, Helen. Do uh, any final questions before we move on to our next segment? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks again, Helen, for uh, lots of uh, useful information there. Thank you, Steve. So, so coming up next, um, we are always looking for uh, interesting topics for these uh, NUG monthly meetings. Uh, tentatively, next month, one of our regular participants will present uh, some work that they have done, so that should be should be really good. Um, we're also planning a topic around nurse uh, documentation and yeah, what's there and how you can uh, join the effort and, and contribute. Um, yeah, as I was saying, we're we're always very interested to um, hear what our users are doing. So if you've got some work that you'd like to show off, um, the no monthly meeting is a, a, a good opportunity for it. And um, yeah, we're very interested to hear. You can uh, either send a ticket or DM me on uh, Slack if you have something that you would be interested in presenting. A quick look through last month's numbers. So uh, on Corey, we had uh, three outages, one being the, the schedule maintenance and two small outages uh, totaling three hours. One was an issue with some service nodes and the other was an issue with C-Scratch that uh, caused some, some grief. Um, so I was looking through a few other yeah, uh, samples of numbers that, that tell interesting things about the state of the system. And one, if you haven't already found it, is on my.nurse.gov uh, under, I think it's under jobs. And there's one of the, um, the pages is called Q backlogs. And what the backlog is, is as, as basically the sum of the amount of work that's currently in the queue um, in units of like one whole system. So what this chart is showing, the text here is a little bit small, the top chart is for Haswell. Uh, and near the, uh, the end of November, beginning of December, we're kind of hovering a little over 7.5, kind of eight, um, a Q, Q backlog of 7.5 or eight. And what that means is that there's yeah, 7.5 or eight days worth of work using all of the resources of the um, Corey Haswell nodes. So if all of the Q jobs ran for the entire time that they requested. And you know, often jobs you know, request more than what they need as sort of a, you know, a little bit of a buffer. So, so this can be a slight overestimate, but it would take uh, seven and a half days for all of that work to get through the queue, and, uh, which can sort of give some hints about how long you can expect a job to wait, uh, particularly if it's, a, if it's a long job. Short jobs can usually jump the queue and, sh and start earlier. Uh, we have a lot more KNL nodes. The bottom chart is KNL. Uh, we have a lot more KNL nodes than Haswell nodes. And the backlog on that one is that this is actually quite difficult to read, but I think it's about it, it hovering around the four mark. So that's a, a useful uh, chart to look at if you're wondering where your job is in the queue. So Steve, that's the queue, si uh, queue sizes, right? Queue waiting size. Do you have an average on how long the queue normally you know, timing wise. Uh, yes, there is There is another page on mydirtnurse.gov. Uh, I think it's under, it's either under jobs or under center status. There, there are two sections that overlap a little bit there. Uh, and it's about average queue wait times. 
Um, and that shows sort of for different uh, sizes of jobs in terms of number of nodes and length of jobs in terms of number of wall clock hours. Uh, by taking a sample of recent jobs, uh, it shows you know, what was the average wait time okay. for that sample. So, so that can be sort of a, a good kind of hint for um, when you're sizing your job too. Um, I thought this is kind of an interesting chart where normally have a, a you know, just a, a few numbers here on the screen about new, new tickets coming in and tickets closed. So this is actually showing uh, tickets coming in, or yeah, new, new tickets coming in, the, the colors are for different resources or different, yeah, uh, yeah essentially different types of requests. Um, but you can see the, the number of tickets coming in over, this is actually over a, over a couple of years on a, on a month by month basis, can be quite high, you know, several, several hundred per month in some cases. And the, the bottom one here is the number of kind of active, you know, currently open tickets. This, this one's only over a month. But you can see that's uh, a lot more consistent, which pretty much tells us that uh, nurse support is fielding tickets at, at roughly the same rate that they come in, but we, we still do have a, a bit of a backlog. Um, and so well, I've got for last month's numbers, sorry. Sorry, Steve. Yeah. It seems to me uh, that I have most of the questions, but anyway, since I don't have a, a legend here, so what is the biggest, uh, uh, you know, breakdown for the tickets? What categories? Um, so, so Corey obviously is a big chunk of it, and I suspect that the green ones are in this one. I, should have kept well, it, it, yeah, if it takes um, too long, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so, so we tend to get a lot of questions about uh, Corey, a lot of questions about sort of the allocations and iris uh, requests for access to things. This is this is quite a, a broad swathe of tickets, and it also includes things that um, you know are more kind of off off to the edge. Um, where we're seeing more tickets about pearl matter. Um, Good number of tickets about um, you know software and sort of you know, uh, understanding well either either using or installing software and another one is uh, understanding what happened with jobs. Okay, to be a, a popular um, or what do you call it a, a frequent uh, query that people have. But yeah, actually that would probably be an interesting. Um, Topic itself is a, a breakdown of the types of questions that people ask. That'd be a good topic of the month for, for one coming up. Since no one else asks questions, let me ask a slightly more. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, can you share a little bit about the three outage? Uh, what is the reason behind it? Was that because of the hardware failure? Or is that a power outage or what exactly? And um, typically uh, how long that takes? Uh, so, I mean, different, different things can cause an outage and we, you know, look back over, over the, the last few months, we can see quite a few you know, different causes of when there's, when, when there's an outage. Um, we have kind of, there are, there are certain like definitions about what defines an outage so so for instance if if something causes the amount of um you know the, the fraction of nodes in use on quarry to drop below some threshold for instance that triggers an alarm um because you know it often suggests that there's something wrong although it can just mean that there's a very large job in the queue and a lot of other jobs need to be you know need, nodes need to be drained for it to for it to start so it's one of our you know ongoing um challenges with getting, you know, ensuring that there's uh, good utilization as well as sort of, you know, fair access and, and so on like that. Um, so the, the, the second one here, C-Scratch is a Lustre file system. Lustre is a very high performing and very high scaling file system. But, you know, it, it's a, it's like running a Formula One car versus running your own, um, you know, personal regular car. It, uh, 
it requires a little bit more care and feeding than than a lot of other uh, file systems. And you know, yeah, occasionally things kind of jam up in some way or another. And because uh, C scratch is sort of fairly fairly critical to the system, it can cause the the system to become effectively unavailable for a while. So that that happened here. Um, the problem with the service nodes uh, was essentially yeah, one of the one of the yeah, management sort of services that uh, keeps different aspects of Cori running. Uh, I think something went wrong with one of them, and it took a little while to to clear and you know, make the. Uh, so uh, if if I may for a little bit, yeah. If I may, because it sounds like none of these are actually hardware failures. Mostly um, is the congestions or this kind of thing. Uh, so, so we do get a mixture of hardware failures and software issues, and um, I don't actually know what the, the breakdown is. Uh, last month, for instance, um, we had at least one outage that was due to a, a power unit, like a, a, a rectifier or something like that, hardware unit yeah. failed and it took down a cabinet. Um, and when it took down a cabinet, it took down some service nodes and so on, and, and so yeah, that had some not going to fix. So, so we do occasionally get hardware failures. Okay. So when this kind of thing happens, do you do the partition shut down or you know, the whole system gets shut down? So, so usually when it's an unscheduled outage, it means that something kind of causes the system to be not kind of effectively usable. Okay. Um, you know, it might be stopping jobs from starting or stopping people from being able to log in or you know, if the file system's so frozen up that people's sessions freeze. Uh, when it's a scheduled outage, it's, it's usually a, a much more, well, you know, it's a, yeah, a much more sort of controlled shutdown of the system and bring back up for, for maintenance. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we're right at the top of the hour. Um, Thank you all for joining. We'll post the slides and recording uh, shortly on the web page for the for the meeting, and we'll see you after the new year. Um, enjoy the holidays for everybody who will be celebrating them, and hopefully you get uh, a bit of a break. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays to all.